Okay. Hello. Right. Okay. Now, um, okay, guys, I'm just opening another program because it's just that this computer is a little bit, uh, a little bit slow. Now the thing is, okay, that's right. That's right. So, okay. Uh, let me just share the screen. Hello, Diana. And now, which one are we going to share? It's that one. Okay. So, okay, great. Okay. I see it. Right. Okay. So, as you can see, I'm in the I'm in the spaceship today. So, um, the only thing is sometimes sometimes the audio or the the video signal might be a little bit sort of jerky because of the the line okay although it is a cable connection um so i'm just going to make sure i have the chat open so that i can see any comments if it will open up it's just oh everything just seems to be taking so long today uh, come on guys come on open i want to see the chat there uh, there it is Okay, hello everybody else. Hello, hello everybody from Cro uh, Croatia. Okay, so. Okay, so let's just see this. Oh, la, 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 la. oh. there's a delay. Okay, hello everyone. Okay, so um, yeah, it's interesting times, I suppose, because um, just as we were, uh, just as we've been talking about, um, we've been talking about environmental things over the last few months. Um, just this week and last week in Glasgow there is of course the the COP26 conference um, which um, uh, Boris Johnson is hoping will uh, demonstrate how he saved the world I'm being ironic okay um, and I think, well, of course, it's just a, it's just a an indication of um, how serious things seem to be getting now. So um, I think that it's fair to say that we are on the uh, we are on the cusp of a of um, a major. A major change, um, a major change. Whether that comes from government or whether it comes from us, I think um, I think it would be better if it came from from us. To be honest, I think. Um, but I think that, uh, as Bob Dylan said, times they are a changing. Okay, so part of this change, uh, which is linked, which has a number of different aspects to it, um, part of this change is, of course, uh, is the the climate crisis, which um, seems to have all of a sudden uh, appeared. If we think about ten years ago, twenty years ago, thirty years ago, um, people weren't so um, I wouldn't say they were so interested in it. It's just that it wasn't really on the radar. Um, but of course, within that uh, within that climate discussion, uh, there are a whole set of uh, pieces, and these are the pieces that we've been talking about because we've got where we've got to because of the way we have um, used resources in the past and the way we are using resources now. And so our lifestyle 
is very much linked to um, different aspects of the uh, uh, different aspects of what is what is happening at the moment. Okay. So last time, I think we were talk we started to talk about um, plastics and microplastics, and I got most of the way through this, but. I wanted to. F I want to just finish um, finish the um, finish that topic, and then we're going to move into something which is completely different. But yet, it's a, it's yet another facet, another face, another um, perspective, if you like, of this um, uh, this epochal moment, um, and that is about. Um, urban life, cities and towns. Um, so we'll we'll come to that um, we'll come to that in a in a little while. But uh, as I say, I wanted to finish the the part about the plastics first because I think we had got to. Uh, let me just see if I can uh, move this through, and it's going to it's going to sort of be a little bit. A little bit, probably standard. Okay, okay, we have the propylene die. Come on, we have the <laughs> the Scottish guy. We have the guys. Um, uh, this, I think this is this is Stefano on his day off. Um, we've got uh, plastics, da 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 da. Microplastics. We'd finished. We ended up on microplastics, and um, we talked about how. Even microplastics, if you asked people 10 years ago, um, people would say, oh, what are microplastics? Because it hadn't really been appreciated exactly uh, how invasive and how um, uh, ubiquitous these things are and how much we've actually put these into our environment and how much we're actually taking into our bodies. And I think the studies, as far as the, um, the effects of microplastics on human health are concerned, I think these studies are still very much um, in their infancy in, uh, for several reasons, um, because before people just didn't really look, and it wasn't clear what they should be looking for. Whereas now, um, it's much clearer, and it's also clear that uh, these uh, these microplastics come from simply from the fact that we use <laughs> we use a lot of plastic. Um, some cases we actually deliberately use uh, microplastics, like for example in the case of some cosmetics. But um, in general, these things are coming from the fact that plastic, like any material, is subject to physical, mechanical, chemical degradation um, as part of the natural geological processes of the uh, the natural ge geological processes of the of the earth, um, and so uh, as we know, uh, mountains are turned into dust essentially. Um, and that dust is carried, and the sand is carried to the sea, uh, where it creates bedrock, which then is, over millions of years, is then up, uplist, uplifted, upthrusted to form new mountains, and the whole thing sort of goes through the uh, goes through the cycle. Plastics do this too, um, but on a on a faster scale, but in ways that we are still not so. Uh, uh, maybe so um, cognizant of. Okay, so the the last part of the uh, last part of the plastic stuff that we didn't that I didn't get to 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 talk about was um, the part about recycling. Um, now I think it's clear that everybody wants to recycle, um, but. There are several things that we should know about recycling, um, which can make it. Um, it's not simply. It's not simply a case of um, 
uh, I use it and then I put it in the right bin and it will be reconverted and what have you because you may have you may already know that um, some things are recyclable completely some things are not recyclable at all and some things are partially recyclable whatever that means um, so if we look at if we look at plastics you look around you and look at plastics I'm just looking at some pens there's a remote control here uh, this is for the monitor okay so I've got all sorts of stuff what about this guy I mean this is nice this is a, a pen drive it's a bit of plastic actually this is metal this is plastic um, and there's other types of plastic inside where the, where the USB goes into the into the computer okay so we've got all sorts of stuff here um, some of this I can do something with some of it I can't and one of the one of the problems with plastic recycling in general is the idea of um, where do I put it? Where do I throw it? I'm sure I'm sure everybody around this teleconference will have had that that moment where you, you you're trying to be you're trying to be virtuous, you're trying to be good, you're trying to be a good citizen. And so you've you've separated the paper from the plastic and from the cardboard, and you have the plastic there, and it's like, well, hold on a minute, what is this made of? Okay, it's plastic, so I'll just throw it in the plastic, but is it PVC? Is it PET? Is it PET? Is it polypropylene? Because according to what it is, uh, it needs to be treated in a particular way. Now, most... I think it's I think it's fair, fair to say that most recycling um is done at a fairly crude level in the sense of you have uh you have your your big stuff like wooden stuff you've got paper uh glass and plastic all gets thrown together but the plastics themselves as we talked about last time are a rather diverse family and one of the one of the problems with the plastic is that with plastics being a diverse family is that you can't treat them all the same okay um, there's another aspect which is that um, it says here that the plastics are relatively new technology well um, I think the timeline was from about 1850 onwards but most of the development was from 1950 onwards 1940s 1950s so um, certainly animals um, but also most other organisms have not had enough exposure on an evolutionary time scale to um, be able to do something with this with plastic now um, what has hap what's happened recently uh, last couple of years is that um, a number of researchers in different places have uh, reported or we're starting to see reports of um, bacteria or um, invertebrates small invertebrates, worms, this type of thing, which are actually um, digesting the plastic and chemically degrading it. Now, this is a bit different to bacteria or an, uh, an organism just taking it in and keeping it there, because when that organism dies, um, that plastic still remains what's important here is that the animal or the organism is actually using that plastic it's actually using the the elements the, the the molecules in that material to get energy because that way it will break them down okay and one of the one of the key issues here is that the um the synthetic plastics like polypropylene polyethylene have no real equivalence in the natural world and so there's nothing really evolved to make use of that 
at least not yet, although some reports are starting to come out. So I think uh, last year, the year before, some Japanese researchers uh, described a, um, a bacteria which was found in a rubbish dump, of course, this is where you find these things, where there's food, there's opportunity, particularly if you're a bacterium, um, and these guys, uh, okay, I'll, I'll answer your question in a minute, Kamal, okay, I'll just, um, so these guys, these, these bacteria were able to, uh, or are able to um, degrade uh, polyethylene tetra, uh, poly uh, polyethylene terephthalate, PET, okay, um, from a, let's say, a biochemical point of view, it's, ac it's actually an easy one because, the, because of the way the molecules are put together. Um, it's, uh, there's, a, there's what we call functional groups which allow, the, allow enzymes or give a, a place for enzymes to actually work on. The big problems are with things like the polyethylenes and the polypropylenes because there the chemistry and the biochemistry involved is much more difficult, um, even for bacteria. However, uh, however, there are reports coming out that um, people are working on, um, let's say, encouraging bacteria to uh, to exploit these materials. So, um, so from a certain point of view, this is this. This is starting to this is starting to happen, and there is a lot of, let's say, with a lot of um, attention being placed to recycling, or being placed on recycling. Uh, these are approaches which will become ever more important because uh, sticking plastic bottles in a bioreactor um, is a lot is probably a lot more eco-friendly than trying to degrade them chemically or burn them or whatever okay um, but the problem is also the fact that how we use it is the fact of how we use the plastic so um, as I say I was looking at this look at this pen here I mean this is these are actually nice pens to write with um, but compare it to this one and I'm not I'm not in any way endorsing the companies that make these things this is metal this is a metal tube okay so it's clear that well metals are completely recyclable because you can you just melt them <laughs> and make something else yeah in the end so for example uh, an aluminium can or a, if you have a, a coke bottle or a, a coke can um, the can is better unless the bottle is made of glass of course if you have a plastic bottle uh, the can is better because aluminium is 100% recyclable so um, the uh, the key thing here is let's say making making it easy for people to recycle okay um, my personal uh, my personal beef at least at the moment is with um, boxes of pasta now I really like pasta I shouldn't but I do and um, I get annoyed about boxes of pasta with a little plastic window why do I I know what's in the box there's a picture of it on the front I don't need to see it okay so why not just have a, a, a normal box okay um, other things where you are as I say where you're trying to decide whether something is does it go in the uh, does it go in the the plastic recycling or does it go in the um, in the mixed waste which you can't uh, you can't do anything with because sometimes you find things made of, of two or more different types of materials and the other thing is that as I say here this is a relatively low cost low value disposable item so yes I'm starting to make myself feel guilty for the fact that I have this um, but this is just an exa this is just an example of uh, um, once upon a time once upon a time we 
used fountain pens, uh, which in, in Italian, uh, the, the stilo, you know, the stylographic pens, the fountain pens. And, well, those things would last you a lifetime, basically, if you had a good one. So, so there, there's some f food for thought here. Okay, so... Um, Looking at plastic as a, as, a, as a plastic waste as a resource, um, there are different <coughs> different things which are associated with the lifestyle, or, sorry, not the lifestyle, the life cycle of plastic, okay? Um, and so you can see this is sort of like a recycling, uh, it's like a recycling circle where you have the objects, typically pile jumpers, uh, things like bottles, things like chairs. Um, so some of the, um, let me get rid of that. Yeah. So, so, so for example, some of the, some of the, some of the types of plastic can be reutilized again and again. So if you take something like PET, PET, which is typically for bottles, if you, if you break it down, um, you can get the monomers, you can get the, what we call the feedstocks back. In other words, you get what you started with. So you just do the reaction again and you get more of the product. Okay? Um, something like uh, polypropylene or something like polyethylene, um, when, you, when you try to recycle them, you actually degrade, you degrade the quality of what you can get back. Okay, so some of it you can recycle it to a to a, to an extent, but in some cases um, you have to use it in a different use. You have to repurpose. Uh, you can't necessarily make the same thing, the same object again. Okay, um, and so if you like, there's the sort of like a, there's like um, you're eroding the value. You are eroding the value as you uh, as you recycle until at some point you may not be able to recycle. You may not be able to make anything decent anymore, and so you would then use this for energy recovery. Okay. Um, now, uh, energy recovery is a little bit of a let's say. Um, uh, a topic which makes people uh, get a little bit angry and froth at the mouth a little bit, because one of the one of the aspects of this is whether um, the whether the, the 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 waste fumes are treated properly, because when you're burning plastics and stuff. Um, you need to have the proper chemi you need to have the proper physical conditions to get the proper chemistry going on so that you get complete combustion um, however it is a way of recovering energy uh, in terms of the uh, energetic value that's in the, the, the molecules of the plastic themselves um, or which could be for uh, the grid, it could be for your home, it could be for factories, okay, there's lots of possibilities. In the end, it's a sort of like, um, it's a, when we talked about um, uh, an energy currency, in a way, it's a sort of like an er energy currency, it's something which contains the energy, you can move it around and you can do different things with it. Okay, so um, plastic waste is a potential resource, um, but it has to be treated. It has to be treated in uh, in the correct way. Now, um, just looking at K Kamal's question on the chat. Uh, so he says, "Do biodegradable plastics are separated in the micro in time if they are left in nature? I mean, are they any better?" Okay, that's good, that's a good question um, because the the whole point of biodegradable plastics is that. They are um, they are tasty. <laughs> let's say they are tasty for um, microorganisms. Yeah, 
so if they are left in the right environment so some of them some of these things can be composted so they can be put in uh, composting uh, heaps um, where there's a whole community of uh, bacteria and molds and stuff which are quite happy to use the um, to use the uh, the plastic as food um, in that case it's a chemical degradation and so you don't get the microplastics because the mechanically the biodegradable plastics um, are not in the same let's say they're not in the same class they're not in the same league as the true plastics um, and so they will degrade I'd say chemically but it's actually biochemically because it's bacteria that are that are pulling them apart okay so in that case you won't get you won't get microplastics from um, uh, from bioplastics in the same way that you would get microplastics from a piece of polypropylene that's gradually being worn apart by the wind and the waves and the sun and the uh, and the air and, and the wind and the heat okay so I hope that's I hope that's that's useful um, okay so uh, where is where are plastics produced um, historically uh, historically Europe has played um, a very large role in the development and uh, distribution of plastics uh, and the use of plastics uh, for, for many reasons Sim one of the main being that the that historically the uh, the chemical industries in the in the in in the EU or in in Europe in general here I'm including the UK um, are uh, were associated with massive economic development and so um, over time though this has uh, this has shifted and so the um, the main producers now are in China, uh, mostly in China. Uh, there is some in Japan. Uh, there's some in places like Vietnam and other places like that, but it's mostly China. Um, the U.S. is more or less similar to Europe, and again, that reflects that historically um, the American chemical industry was very strong in. Uh, in in producing these things, well, we saw last time Dupont uh, has in, has thousands of patents on these on different types of plastics, uh, which are completely normal everyday uh, things that we come across all the time. Um, so these are the main. It's, it's mainly the U.S., Europe, and China uh, which dominate the production of plastics. Now, this is 2019. Um, a third is produced of the world's plastics produced by China. Um, this is an immense number. World plastics production is 368 million tons. So if you if you want that in kilos, that's 368 billion kilos. So that's a lot of kilos. I don't know whether you can see my whether you can see my 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 writing here, um, but this is uh, this is one of the um, the things, and it's clear that this is not sustainable in any way. Um, where does this stuff go? Where does this stuff go? Well, there's a fair mix, and this reflects that. The fact that we find find these things absolutely everywhere, um, but the main is packaging. And I think over time, because of the um, because of the convenience associated with uh, because of the, the convenience associated with plastic packaging. Um, it's clear that plastic packaging has, has plastic has come to dominate the um, how things are are wrapped 
to deliver to the final consumer. And if we think about the growth in the consumer uh, consumer business, so um, just think about well, every time you buy a um, uh, well a computer or a whatever uh, a washing machine or a, a microwave or anything which is sort of medium sized, you, you you will almost certainly find it at least up until a few years ago. You'd find it encased in polystyrene. Um, polystyrene is actually a really, uh, it's a great plastic for packaging because it really protects the stuff. Um, it's a terrible plastic for the environment because um, it's very bulky but it's very light so it's energetically extremely wasteful to transport it. Um, and you need to keep it separate from other plastics. So recycling the plastics, you need to keep them separate. Um, and polystyrene is just uh, is terrible stuff. But I think what's happening is people are starting to go back to paper and cardboard because people have become a lot more ingenious about how these things can be used and how you can use the natural strength of cardboard and even paper which doesn't sound like a very strong thing if you fold it correctly if you work it correctly you can have uh, you can have good uh, good protection okay um, the next uh, the next biggest segment is building and construction um, so that's all sorts of different things including including um, the uh, the foams which are used for insulating, uh, so you, your urethanes and stuff like this. Um, so there's a whole pile of a whole pile of different things in uh, building and construction. Um, the rest of it, well, we're sort of getting down into relatively small numbers. Ten percent on automo automotive now. Um, I don't know if anybody knows anybody who works in the car industry, but I have a question about the car industry, um, which is, okay, if you're not driving a Maserati or a Ferrari or a Porsche, okay, why does the internal decor, why is it made of plastic? but made to look like leather, when it obviously isn't leather, I don't understand because it's extremely difficult to clean. <laughs> it's, just, it's just something which I just do not understand. Okay, um, okay. now we've got electrical, electronic, blah, blah, blah. Okay, um, but the fact that there's this sort of long tail of lots of different uses just tells you how diffuse the, the, the use of plastics uh, are what the use of plastics is, and also um, how not one big thing is dominating. Once we've sorted packaging and maybe building and construction, how do we deal with the rest? That's that becomes a question. Okay, so um, I think I've alluded to this idea that uh, not all plastics are the same. And so you have to you have to treat them in different ways. Um, the classic, for a long time, the classic example was the or it has been the bottles of water. So your uh, your bottle of water, your top would typically be something like polypropylene, but the bottle would be something like PET. Now, if you want to, if you want to recycle these things, these are two chemically they are very, very different, and so you have to you have to recycle them in very, very different ways. So this is why people would collect the, the polypropylene tops because they are higher value than the PET because they're actually easy to uh, recycle. You can just basically grind them up and and, and heat them up again. Okay. Um, so this is you know th this is a th this is a, um, um, an important point in terms of recycling. Um, 
Okay, so uh, let me just sort of go on. So yeah, so you will have seen the symbols. Um, so you've got this is the PET, the polyethylene terephthalate. You've got um, high density polyethylene, low density polyethylene, which are used for very different things, and they need to be treated in very different ways. You've got polypropylene, which is related but different. You've got polystyrene, completely different animal, PVC, polyvinyl fluoride. Um, now PVC is a, it gets a bit of a bad rap. It's uh, because recycling it is um, difficult and costly, and it's potentially polluting. Okay. However. You have to look at the other side of, of things. Um, PVC, modern PVC window frames are much, much better insulators than any of the alternatives, be they wood, be they aluminium. Um, so in terms of energy efficiency, if you are isolating your house from the environment or if you are um, trying to improve the energy efficiency of your house by changing the windows um, it's not enough to have double glazing you need for example you need the right type of surrounds um, now I'm, I'm not an a I'm not advocating a, and I don't work for anybody who sells PVC but I am sort of advocating thinking about the use of this thing I don't change the windows every year. This is something which will stay in the house for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So um, these are things which you, which should be taken into consideration. Um, you cannot get anywhere near the equivalent thermal efficiency with uh, even with wood frames. Um, on the other hand, of course, if you are throwing PVC away, it's it, it's bad bad stuff. It's bad karma. Um, you are uh, you have to treat the you have to treat these these uh, these molecules in in a very particular way. Um, another example is PVC is often used for tubing. Um, if you've ever seen big building sites where maybe people are building a, uh, a commercial center or a, a sky you know, an apartment block or something like this you will see orange typically orange <laughs> typically bright orange tubes all over the place these are this is PVC um, it's very hard it's very tough and it's very very inert it doesn't do anything basically um, and in fact it was uh, just a couple of years ago there was a report of um, some building work in Germany where the uh, the builders or the workers um, had to dig up some tubes uh, and these were tubes from about 1950 1960 um, and they thought they were going to have to replace them because these were old PVC tubes they dug them up and they, it was as if they had been put there the day before. Nothing had happened. Basically, they just they were as they were uh, at the beginning. So, um, in some cases, in some cases, um, it's true. The, the the plastic is. You have the idea that you know maybe we shouldn't, but you have to weigh up the pros and cons. Okay. Um, but we also have this, and this is the one which always um, uh, worries me a little bit, because other, this is everything else. Well, there are literally hundreds of different types of plastic. So uh, there's all sorts of, all sorts of stuff there. Um, this is something which you may have come across. Um, you may not have thought about it, though, because until the early 20th century um, most in fact all things were made of big things would be made of wooden metal small things like a watch or a clock 
the, the cogs inside uh, the mechanisms, even if they were industrially made, they would be made of metal. Um, and it was around about 1920s where, um, I can't remember the name of the guy, uh, in a German chemical company, it could have been Ige Farben, um, started, uh, or BASF maybe, they started to work with um, plastics as a substitute for small metal pieces in machines. And it's clear that um, there are lots of advantages, there are lots of advantages of using uh, things like using uh, tough plastics for small pieces um, because it's a hell of a lot cheaper. Uh, than trying to uh, create die casts of metals because you have a whole set of things where you have to clean and it becomes very um, it becomes very expensive. So industrially, of course, there, industrially there was a big push towards uh, the use of um, use of, pla of plastics to uh, not just replace, let's say, the outsides of things but also to replace the the way things, uh, the pieces that were in movement as well. Okay. Um, so if we look at the sorts of things which, uh, the sorts of uses for different plastics, we have everything from, um, well, we met these these guys yesterday, the, the, polyte the polytetrafluoroethylenes, the, tefl the teflons, um, uh, you have things like the PET bottles, you've got um, high density polyethylene, that would be like your white milk bottles, that type of thing, your toys, um, PVCs, the windows, your boots. This is, this is stuff, as I say, this is stuff which lasts for a long time. Um, low density uh, polyethylene, so you've got different types of packaging, you've got um, bags, that type of thing. Um, You've got uh, wire wire cables. Uh, this is um, uh, this is a, a type of um, a type of polyethylene which is related to the low density. Um, it's used for cabling. You know, when you look at um, really small cables in electronic components, and you wonder how they could possibly make these things, um, this is the sort of stuff that they're using. Okay. Um, polypropylene, pl flower pots, plant pots, car car parts, bumpers, this type of thing. Um, polystyrene, yogurt pots. Um, now polystyrene also has the um, uh, has the uh, the property of being quite rigid, so it can be good for uh, things like um, glass frames. Um, but you may also have um, polycarbonate. You may have polycarbonate glasses if you're talking about safety glasses, for example. Um, so there's all, so all sorts of different, um, excuse me, all sorts of different uh, uses for these um, uh, for these different types of plastic. And then you've got things like polyurethane, polyurethane, polyurethane. Uh, which can be foamed has excellent uh, insulating properties um, and so again if we're thinking about uh, energy efficiency if you're thinking about um, improving uh, energy consumption this is these are the types of ch these are the types of materials which are high performing and will give you the the performance that you need. Um, just going to mention ABS, uh, acrylobutanitrile styrene uh, bricks, ABS, which is um, Lego. Um, Lego is fantastic stuff. Uh, and even though it is made of plastic, again, the value of something like this, you don't throw this out. You hand it on or you give it away to someone else who will use it. So. We also have to we also have to bear that in mind too. Okay, so a lot of the uh, a lot of the plastic is being used for low value stuff. 
and I think that's the that's the key to uh, a lot of this um, thing about using too much plastic and getting out of the habit because a lot of packaging why can't it just be paper packaging again once upon a time it w we bought biscuits and bread in packages which were made be cardboard or which were um, which were made of paper why can't they why can't we we go back to that um, so and then of course now this talks about invisible plastics and we've got some computers here um, and again these are th these are the sorts of things which well okay I, I'm surrounded by computers here uh, well I'm surrounded by computers but um, screens and there's plastic and there's stuff here um, but there's also hidden stuff what about medical uh, plastics what about the uh, the water pipes, the the condu electrical con conduits? These are things which will stay and stay in place, and it's only when I knock the wall down that I will actually expose these things. It's only when I throw the computer away that these things would will be um, will become a problem. Um, computers are a particular particular bugbear, I think, because um, there is of course this uh, seems to be an in inexorable rush to um you need to have the the most up to date the fastest the whatever um and so even though you may have something which which you perfectly which you like and you per you're perfectly happy with I, i'm thinking about me because i i i have a i have an old thinkpad which has a fantastic keyboard um, and I'm just worrying that one day it's starting to get slow and so I keep taking stuff off it um, but I worry that one day um, it's it, I'm not going to be able to use it anymore because uh, it will have been rendered uh, rendered unusable not because it itself is not functioning but because of the programs etc they, they require more memory they require more speed etc so um, but I would like to I would just like to keep it because it's fantastic for what I do and I'm uh, if you've ever used if you ever used an old ThinkPad uh, keyboard you will know what I mean because they <laughs> they're spectacular um, okay so what is this about in the end this is about being smarter and um, more sensible about using uh, using plastics we've mentioned that packaging is a big big problem and I think I've got some notes here about bioplastics um, so we have these so if we look at this this picture just for a minute apart from the teddy bear it looks a bit forlorn there in the in the net um, fishing nets well once upon a time fishing nets would be made of hemp or uh, a similar type of organic material and over time these things would just degrade as they became food for uh, food for the um, for the bacteria okay now okay I'm seeing sorry just checking the okay uh, I hate by okay here we go uh, yeah yeah okay uh, this is, so just I've, I'm just reading the comments on the chat here I hate by this kind of products that are packed and repacked and packed again I think yeah yeah okay so uh, this is this is um, I think it is it Maria Carmen saying this idea I think authorities should should rule on this well a few years ago um, certainly in Italy but I'm not sure whether it was at the level of the European community um, there was the institution of um, the rule that you couldn't use single-use plastic bags for um, uh, for for shopping unless they were biodegradable and uh, I think I mean I think it makes perfect sense and of course everyone says oh, it's going to cost us more and this and that and this and that <sighs> yeah okay um, it's going to cost us more but what is the environmental cost of um, 
polypropylene, polyethylene plastic bags floating around in our fields and in, in our rivers. So um, I think there, I think you are right uh, that there is a role to be played for legislation um, in not just nudging people because in the end what sort of freedom is it to be able to choose a plastic bag that's not freedom that's just it's neither here nor there the best thing is a cotton bag <laughs> of course um, like your grandmother used to use yeah uh, there's no uh, there's, there's no need to to, to keep um, wasting petrol in this way. So um, so yeah, and I would just add that I think that there is a, there's also space for legislation about um, excessive packaging and making packaging obvious so that I know exactly how to recycle it so I know exactly where to put it okay um, okay so if we're thinking about um, bioplastics biodegradable plastics um, you need to be thinking about some questions and those questions are um, how quickly this thing is let's say reintegrated into the environment um, how quickly are the ingredients that go into making the plastic created in the environment um, and how much pollution or waste is created during the process of actually making the plastic now um, if you ask these questions uh, traditional past plastics are terrible However, if you ask another question, which is um, about performance, in other words, uh, getting the right material for the right job, um, bioplastics don't do very well, <laughs> unfortunately, because as we all know, and I think the uh, experience of the supermarket uh, biodegradable shopping bags uh, will tell us that um, these things have terrible mechanical properties compared to a, a similar a plastic bag of si a, a polyethylene polypropylene uh, bag of similar dimensions um, uh, biodegradable bioplastics just do do not do not measure up um, however there's a lot of work going on to try and find ways around the uh, the, the, the performance uh, issue. Um, so, uh, what's making uh, what's making a, a, gre a green plastic? Uh, so we need biodegradability. So this means, um, let's say, the uh, the chemistry. Between, for example, between these two is very different. Um, this is biodegradable, and the Japanese scientists with their bacteria have found this. This is not, or at least not easily. Not at the not. Uh, nothing has been found so far. Um, so you've got biodegradability. Um, what about the ingredients that go into it? So um, the idea of renewable ingredients. Now, where does the where do these renewable ingredients come from? Um, it's typically plants, um, and so the uh, the idea is that um, just so just noticing that the chat was uh, slowing down a little bit. Um, so typical. Oh, oh no. Okay. Maybe, maybe, yeah. Okay, it's coming up. No, uh, okay. I wish there were no fishing nets at all. Okay, so you don't. You, so, Kemal, do you like fish? <laughs> or do you fish? <laughs> so, fish, fishing, uh, fishing on your own is. 
pretty difficult. Okay, I'm vegan. Ah, okay, right, okay. Well, yeah, okay, you're a vegan. Um, many people aren't. So uh, fishing nets are a, let's say, a necessary evil for certain things. Um, but looking at, just looking back at the... Um, are plastic shopping bags cheaper than paper ones? Yes, they are. They are. And they're also stronger uh, under most conditions, and particularly if you get them wet. That's, the, that, that's, that's one of the... But the, there's no competition if you have a cotton bag, you know, one of those, uh, one of those cotton shoppers that maybe your grandmother used to use. Okay, renewable ingredients. So you're talking about uh, using plant-based materials typically. And the processing, of course, uh, has to be uh, relatively um, relatively environmentally friendly from the waste point of view, but also from the uh, the point of view of the um, of the, uh, the 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 chemical processes that you're using to make these things. Because remember, we are talking chemistry here. Whether it's biochemistry or whether it's more chemical, we are still talking chemistry in some way. This stuff has to be it has to be assembled. It has to be made as molecules. Um, as far as the uh, materials themselves are concerned, there is some f form of polymer, something like a polymer, so it could be like a cellulose derivative, if we think. Uh, um, here, we're sort of not too far away from, um, we're not too far away from textiles. Um, but uh, again, in some cases you can substitute textiles for polymers for, for plastics. In other cases, you can't. Typically, you will have a plasticizer. Okay, uh, so we've got, I re use and reuse my cotton bags not so many times. That's the best thing. You just carry one in your rucksack, so when you go to the or in your bag, so that when you go to the supermarket, you can just uh, you can just pop it out. Um, so yeah, so you will have the polymer, the thing itself, uh, a plasticizer, and additives. Now, these things can be various, uh, let me just, these things can be various uh, types of materials. Um, and the word itself, we think about, uh, we think about, po <laughs> we think about, I'd say poisons, things which shouldn't be in there. Um, we think about plasticizers. You may know about um, uh, some of the plasticizers which come from uh, plastic films, which are known to be um, uh, molecules which maybe affect the uh, the hormone systems and uh, what have you. Um, why do we add these? Well, typically, and this is true of bioplastics as it is true of normal plastics. Um, they are in there because the, the raw material itself does not have all of the mechanical properties or the physical properties that you actually want from the material itself. So, um, for an exa uh, as, an, as an example, you would want something, uh, you might want something which is, uh, which can be um, very flexible, maybe a little bit stretchy, but still very strong, okay? And so, to get that, you will have extra things in there. Additives may be things like, um, maybe things like um, silica and sort of sand, deriv sand derivatives, this type of thing, which bulk out the um, the material to give it more uh, to give it more mass. Um, why are they in there? Again, part of this is economic, but part of it is also to do with the um, the physical properties that you want in the material at the end. This is material science. Okay, so um, green plastics. Um, I've got some. I've got some corn here because green plastics are typically associated with production of plants like maize. Um, 
and uh, these they can uh, these these polymers that are found in nature. Uh, there are various types, uh, but typically they're plant in origin, um, and they can be found in all sorts of different uh, different agricultural and also marine um, systems. So, for example, uh, alginates from uh, from algae. Uh, so, you know, this is this is a really uh, uh, there's a lot of a lot of work being done uh, on these uh, on making materials from these things um, with an eye on the biodegradability which is clearly something which uh, they have to um, all of these materials have to have okay however uh, they are in direct competition with um, let's say the current plastics and the problem is that they mostly don't match up in terms of physical characteristics so there's still a lot of work to be done on making um, making the plastics biodegradable plastics with the same mechanical physical physical mechanical characteristics of established uh, plastics okay uh, so they have to be cheaper and they're not cheaper and so typically um, as far as cost is concerned, only starch, uh, which in Italian to amido, um, is that's the only biopolymer which can compete with synthetic polymers in terms of cost. However, it is only used in certain situations in niche uses simply because it's. Um, it, it's not as let's say flexible in its uses as as, uh, as the, the 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 oil based uh, plastic derivatives. Okay, so the big problem here is cost, um, and of course people don't really when you people are used to paying or not paying for a supermarket shopping bag, um, they complain when they have to pay ten cents for uh, the the shopping bag. Now. Um, in many cases for these people for us maybe it doesn't really make much difference for some people it does but for, other, for many people it doesn't and so this is the price that we have to pay you are not going to get biodegradable uh, at the same price that you have um, non-degradable non and this is the, uh, the legislation part which uh, I think Maria Carmen to, uh, mentioned Incentivizing, disincentivizing. So um, uh, we're going. I think. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot more of this happening over the next few years. Not just in terms of plastic, but in terms of uh, CO2, uh, CO2 production, um, because it's clear that if you want to behave, if you want to change people's behaviour you need incentives and disincentives um, some people will do it from a, a moral standpoint but most people need a bit of a stick and a carrot so um, I think this is this is something that we're going to see a lot more of okay um, so you may have restrictions okay so you can't use materials that are uh, recycled that are not recyclable or not di biodegradable um, you may have uh, limits to the non recyclable stuff that you can use um, but in general what we're seeing is we're seeing a move towards the idea of an eco label where you actually have uh, a better idea as a consumer of which is the more ecologically sustainable um, product so this sort of alludes a little bit to the, 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 the other problem in general is information where do you get information about about things from uh, and if the information is, uh, is, is of good quality okay 
Okay, so uh, as far as biodegradation is concerned, um, you've got uh, sort of, let's say, a hierarchy. Um, but basically what you're talking about is um, bacteria and fungi or algae are using the material as food in some way. Um, and usually what happens first is there's a sort of like a, um, a gross or a, a rough um, degradation, which is um, maybe uh, a bit of hydrolysis to break, to loosen the, the material, break it, uh, break them, um, loosen the molecules up, break the, the molecules a little bit. Um, maybe you have photo, uh, photo uh, degradation, which is sunlight, and you start to... Uh, you start to break them up, you start the process, and then the bacteria come along and do the rest. Okay? Now, um, there's uh, something which is also called oxo uh, degradable, which is oxidative uh, degradation. Um, and there is uh, there is a little bit of a grey area here because um, uh, there's, there are claims to uh, add it to uh, uh, additives which um, make oil-based plastics biodegradable. What does that mean? Well, basically the idea is that um, the the thing, the molecule gets broken down into into pieces. So let's say you've got a big long molecule like this, so you break it up into small pieces. Okay. Um, and the bacteria comes along and eats the eats the piece. But it doesn't do anything. <laughs> it just stays in the bacteria. Okay. So um, this is this is a bit debate a bit debatable. Okay, I think uh, I, this is the uh, this is the key here. Buy less and choose well. Um, so, uh, raising consciousness about uh, uh, about the uh, the, the, plastic, the problems of plastics, um, being aware of how much plastic we're using, and above all, avoiding single-use plastics. Now, in some cases, you can't because there is. Uh, for example, there's a lot of use of single-use plastics in medical medical situations, but you can understand that because the um, the the use of single-use plastic uh, catheters and syringes and stuff they can be made on a on a large scale and sterilised in completely aseptic conditions which might be difficult if not impossible to achieve with glass syringes steel steel implements in a hospital situation um, and since a lot of uh, a lot of infection in hospitals is associated with the use of uh, everyday equipment like catheters and, and, and the such like um, it becomes really important to have uh, to be certain of the uh, the aseptic nature of the of these uh, these uh, these pieces of equipment um, but in everyday situation you're thinking about knives and forks and spoons cutlery plates for a party well okay so um, what's better than single-use plastic well how about recyclable plastic? Fine. What's better than recyclable plastic? How about metal knives and forks and, and normal plates which you wash? You put them in a dishwasher. Okay. So I think that's the uh, that's one of the things that we need to be aware of. Um, okay. So. Biodegradable plastics, in the end, though, I think uh, there's a lot of, let's say, uh, a lot of people sort of seem to, seeming to think that uh, biodegradable will eventually uh, be able to solve a lot of the plastics problems. It won't, because there are, there are, there are, a, num there are a number of 
issues issues associated with it apart from the the simple issue of it it doesn't produce things which have the the the, the mechanical properties that you need or that you might want um, if we're thinking biodegradable we're still thinking in terms of waste the best thing is to not produce the waste in the first place um, but there's also another subtle thing about the biodegradable plastics which uh, some people forget where does this stuff come from well it comes from crops like corn and um, corn in some parts of the world is a staple for people and so just to give you uh, just to give you a, an example um, I've alluded to it here because corn uh, corn is used to make bioethanol it's just ethanol basically which is used in biofuel um, however corn is also eaten in vast quantities in places like Mexico and a few years ago maybe about five seven years ago uh, there was a an increase in the subsidies given to American farmers to to grow corn for ethanol production and so farmers corn farmers switched from selling corn to Mexico to producing effort to selling it to uh, um, biofuel producers to produce ethanol because they were paid more for it that had the knock-on effect that uh, Mexican farmers Mexicans found themselves having to pay a lot more for tacos because the, there was not so much corn uh, around so we have to be very very careful about this and remembering that the amount of let's say space where people can actually grow stuff is not infinite we may find ourselves with a debate about whether do we make a plastic or do we make food okay so um, that's the plastics bit um, if anyone has any if anyone has any comments uh, or any questions um, I would quite happily uh, quite happily we could spend a few a few minutes just looking at uh, questions if anyone has anything okay in Turkey I think a firm about using orisons which are waste of yeah okay yeah um, yeah so th I think there are plenty of let's say local uh, local level initiatives um, I think there was a, a company in uh, there's a company in Italy which is looking at uh, arti artichokes um, because artich artichokes the waste from artichokes the leaves from artichokes um, there was a, there is a company in the UK which is using uh, waste from fish processing so they were using uh, they were use, or they are using um, things which would normally be uh, thrown away uh, as part of the let's say the uh, the waste of the of processing fish for um, uh, for selling as food um, they're actually using this um, to to make a type of uh, bioplastic uh, which is has extremely good properties for uh, wrapping food so uh, this is so for example again it's it's a very it's a niche product in the sense that it's uh, it, it's great for that thing but if you think about it the cellophane that you wrap your food in or that you might find yeah like the stretch films yeah um, that type of cellophane which is typically polypropylene um, it has particular it has particular properties um, but you're not going to make something else out of it you're not going to uh, you're not going to use that type of uh, that type of material in another situation because it's just great for that and so 
I think there are a number of different uh, a number of different um, uh, well there are many many different initiatives and if I can just come back to if I can just come back to what Kamal said um, it's this idea of local and this actually is, is good because it brings us on to what I'm going to talk, what I'm going to introduce now, uh, which is about uh, about um, cities and towns. Um, but it's this idea of using the local resources, what you have locally, um, and being able to um, uh, being able to exploit what you have to make something useful. Um, okay, I'm wondering if the recycled bags from the supermarket are really environment friendly or do they contain parts which are not very good for the environment? Okay, now that's a good question, uh, Christina. Um, I think uh, from your name, I think you must be in, uh, in Italy, I think, so we are probably familiar with the, um, those <laughs> absolutely horrible, smelly, <laughs> Uh, shopping bags that we get in the supermarkets um, yeah they will contain uh, they will contain additives the exact nature is um, uh, will be a, a patented secret almost certainly because they're made by is it Mont Edison I think or some something similar to Mont Edison um, yeah uh, there you would have to I, I I have to admit I've got no idea what's in them other than I know that they are derived from uh, I think it's corn ultimately but there are other things in them to give the uh, to give the material so they have plasticizers and additives to give the material the um, uh, the, f the mechanical properties that it needs to have okay so yeah, great. Thank you for the comments. If anyone else has any uh, has any comments, please uh, please shout up. Okay, so I'm just going to see if I can open this next one. Now, I was just looking at my schedule, and I'm completely behind the schedule. So, but I hope hopefully that's not too much of a problem. Um, let me just see if this will open. Here it comes. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, okay. Yeah. I think I must have changed the format. This is. This looks like a, a cinema format. So I'll just make it a little bit bigger, maybe. Okay. Right. So um, we're sort of we're sort of here. Um, I've just finished with the with the plastics, the microplastics. Um, and I'm going to move on to cities and the idea of sustainable cities. Now, um, I'm going to introduce this now uh, and I will continue it next time. Um, and then we'll start to talk about conservation. Now, in a way, this is okay, this is good because... Um, some of the things which are coming which are which we will see in the uh, in the idea of the sustainable cities will uh, lead us into um, the the topic of interconnectivity and um, the topic of interconnectivity will lead us into thinking about systems so um, I think that I think that where we're going with this is we're going to be looking we're going to be looking at um, we're going to be looking at, at how how systems how these systems work um, and so at some point I will introduce I will bring in some ideas about systems systemic thinking or systems thinking which is one of my um, uh, one of m one of my let's say favorite favorite topics but it's a different part of my life let's say okay so um sustainable cities yeah um today at least for this part um i'm going to be talking about this idea of transition towns 
Now, this is not all of it because there's, there's loads and loads and loads of stuff um, around sustainability in cities. And next time we'll talk a little bit about urban, uh, urban planning and the sorts of things that people, let's say, that people do from a, um, a top a top-down uh, approach. Uh, okay. Uh, what's the, uh, it shows a lot of interactions related to alternatives to plastic. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Carmen. Um, so, coming back to transition towns, this is something. Can I just ask? Uh, has anybody has anybody heard of this 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 phrase here? Can you just put something on the chat if you have? Because I'm very curious. Has anyone ever heard of transition towns? Yeah, okay, Marilena. Okay, no, never. <laughs> Simona. Okay, so Marilena, um, can you just tell me, or can you just put, put a note on the chat? Um, what Tottenham? Yeah, I was. I actually, I thought I was more thinking uh, Tottenham, uh, Tottenham Hotspur, which is the football team, of course. Okay. Uh, um, okay. Yeah. And how, how did you how did you find Tottenham? Uh, okay. Smart. No, it's not. No, uh, it's not the same idea. Okay, uh, so Marilena, so there are circular transition towns. Okay, can you tell me a little bit, Marilena, what you mean by circular transition towns, please? And this isn't a quiz. This is just because I, I want to try and understand where you're coming from. Um, as far as Carmen, Carmen is concerned, um, smart cities, and we'll talk about smart cities um, at some point. That's a very modern, very recent concept. Um, Unconscious? No, 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 not, not. It's got nothing to do with consciousness, unconsciousness. Uh, no, this is, um, this is to do with uh, moving from. Uh, well, you'll see, you'll see, <laughs> you'll see. Okay, two, two seconds. Okay, so, um, so transition towns is a, it's an environmental concept. Which uh, which comes from um, which comes from some work done by some people working in a very particular area of uh, environmental. It's not easy anyway, but I can say they are. S yeah, okay, yeah, uh, we're, yeah, yeah, sort of. Yeah, we. I think we. I think we think you. You will recognise this. I think. Okay, so um, this comes from work which was started in uh, in the UK in the, the year two thousand, so two thousand and five, two thousand and six. Um, by a group of people and one person in particular who was like the driving force of this um, in he was working in the area of uh, a niche a niche area of uh, ecology uh, called permaculture and uh, he basically brought together a whole set of ideas um, and came up with this idea of transition and transition town okay now before I go ahead I have to say this because of the the way these materials are um, I have drawn very heavily on uh, some of the sources in here um, which are referenced at the back of the of the, the let's say the presentation so um, I will endeavor to send this uh, to send this, I will endeavour to say to send these references around. I'll send them to Agnese, who will forward them to uh, the um, forward them to you, so that you can have a look at them yourselves. 
Um, it's a fascinating, fascinating idea, um, which surprisingly, I was surprised to come across it again because I met it, I met it quite a while ago, uh, when I first, well, it must have been about 2007, 2008, when I started studying uh, systems thinking. Um, and so it's nice to see it uh, again. Okay, so I'm just having a look at the the, co the, the comments here. Um, okay, so the the idea of autonomy is there is a, a level of autonomy in in this. Okay, but this is not about it's not about the city state. It's not about the uh, the communes that were back in me medieval Italy. Um, Okay, uh, they take into account uh, agricultural industrial, yes, they, there's a whole set of things which are being uh, taken into consideration here. Okay, so I'm going to start to uh, open this. Now, um, I, my Latin is terrible, I never studied it at school, uh, but I did come across this in a completely different context just the other day. Um, and it was actually talking about Henry VIII for some reason. Um, but I just thought that this was absolutely, it is the, it is the motto. It is the, it is the, the go-to phrase, multum in parvo, less is more. Okay. Um, okay, now uh, there's still some stuff coming in through the chat. Uh, they can live on their own economy and products. No, that's autarky which is a diff that's going too far okay that's not really what the what the transition uh, not really what the, the transition let's say philosophy is it's not about necessarily cutting yourself off and being completely uh, independent and, and what have you but it's um, it's about oops don't think you want gas laws it's about uh, it's about community, and this is what we're we're going to have a look at now. I'm just going to make a note of this. Montevallo. Uh next to near Verona. Whoop! I'd have to check that. I'll have a look at that. See if I can find one. Okay, so. Where are we going? And we start. I started. I started the my <laughs> my diatribe this today, um, talking about COP twenty six and the climate crisis and everything that is now upon us. Um, and if we think about what what does that actually mean? We are talking about a world where we may be beyond oil, but we are certainly low carbon. And if you remember the whole, let's say, the whole idea of the um, uh, of the, or one, sorry, not the whole idea, but one of the one of the mechanisms behind this idea of uh, global warming is the increase in the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and the point is that the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been very high in the past. It was uh, relatively high during the times of the dinosaurs, uh, where the average world temperature was a lot higher than it is now. Um, but dinosaurs are dinosaurs, and they don't live in cities, and they don't have relatively fragile um, civilization. So um, where we're going is this idea of a low carbon world and by its nature this means post oil now you will see the reason why um, oh sorry you will see that tra the transition idea was actually born of a different 
view on oil, uh, but it's still born of a view on oil. It was actually born from the consideration that oil was running out or is running out. Okay. So um, what we're looking at is we're looking at a low carbon world. Sorry, I'm, I'm look this is actually a piece of graffiti. I don't know whether you can see. There's actually a pavement here. So this is a this is painted on a wall somewhere. It's a photograph. Um, and the idea is that we have a, a low carbon world, but with the advantages of the civilization that we've built. Okay, so this is a, without going back to living in caves, which is not good for anybody. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, if I'm correct, less is more some kind of code for living. Yes, that's absolutely correct. Uh, absolutely correct, Vildan. Okay, so um, the price of the present is our future. I thought that was that had quite a nice ring to it as a title. Um, this is a graph of the carbon dioxide emissions. I think we are all well aware of where this is heading. Um, it's just keep go it just keeps going up. Um, most of the well, yeah, the main emitters are in the northern hemisphere, um, and of course that means that uh, if we want this to, if we want to be able to control this in some way, uh, we need to drastically, drastically rethink lifestyles um, and start to respect the. Um, well, the, the biological limits of the planet, because the, the biological system, the biosphere, is where we live. It's, it's where we operate. And so um, it's very much, uh, it's very much, let's say, subject to the physical effects of um, of the environment in which it occur in which it's uh, in which this system is operating and that environment is, a, is an environment which is composed of um, the climate and the geographical or the geological surroundings um, and the climate as we've mentioned as we've said uh, is subject to a set of physical and chemical laws, which, um, just to, for for those of you who remember Star Trek, the old Star Trek, uh, there was uh, Scotty was the uh, the engineer. Now, um, since I'm dealing probably with uh, non-native speakers, you probably don't remember. Uh, it was probably dubbed into your own into your language, but Scotty, the engineer. And you can find him on YouTube. I'll just write it as Scotty from Star Trek. Uh, this is Star Trek. Um, he had this great phrase, which was in a Scottish accent, but I won't do the accent. You can't change the laws of physics, Captain, because Captain Kirk would ask him to do something impossible. And his reply as, a, in, as an engineer would, would be, Captain, you can't change the laws of physics, and that's that's it. We cannot change the laws of physics and chemistry. Um, we have to work. We have to learn how to uh, work within these uh, these constraints, so that, um, for example, uh, the carbon dioxide emissions start to fall. Okay, so. Um, Transitioning, or the transition initiative, uh, it's exploring, it's looking at ways of, let's say, bringing uh, action to address the uh, address the these problems, but at the level of the community. So it's clear that as individuals we we have a part but as communities we have a part just as as countries we have a part to play um, and so this is the view 
and it's sort of reflected in what some people have been saying on the chat. Um, it's a viewpoint which is very much rooted in uh, in the idea of a community of the community, which is the place where you live and the interactions that you have. Um, not necessarily just sort of you know the people ne who your, your neighbours or people down the street. It's it can be a little bit broader than that, but it's the idea of the community as a as an ecosystem and as a self self sustaining ecosystem. So this is where the when people have been talking about autonomy um, on the on the chat. This is this is where this uh, the, the the autonomy comes in. It's this idea of something which um, sustains itself. Okay, so let's have a look. See what is it? Uh, some uh, there's a definition of transition here, um, and as a chemist, I'm sort of uh, very interested in transitions because I, I I'm. I spent my life trying to turn useless me base metals into gold, but I've not managed yet. I'll let you know if I if I get there. Um, but this is about a passage from one form state to another. But it can also be a period of a period of transformation, and. In a way, the transition initiative, as applied to uh, towns and communities, is very much. It takes both of these things. Um, it's a passage, or it's a it's a change from a state of um, dependence on oil, uh, maybe um, a whole set of problems, bad traffic, what have you, to a state where. Uh, there is more resilience within the community and there is more attention paid to um, to quality of life okay and so the idea of less is more is certainly becomes uh, comes comes to the fore here um, so the transition initiative um, it started as I say back in I think it was 2005 2006 um, and it initially was pushed, um, well actually the, the, the original idea was back in the 90s. Um, it came from the idea, from a consideration of peak oil. Um, I'll show a graph in a minute, but peak oil, it doesn't take too much imagination to, it, to work out what this is. Um, it's the idea that we live on a finite planet and despite what people have told us in the past, there can only be, logically speaking, there can only be a certain amount of stuff here. And amongst that certain amount of stuff, there can only be a certain number of litres, gallons, barrels, kilos, tonnes, however you want to describe it, of oil. Um, and so, of course, the idea was uh, back in the 90s that, well, oil will run out in 20, 30 years. What's going to happen then? Um, so you could imagine you know, uh, the automotive industry, uh, the oil extraction industry, the en energy industries. All of these industries would be in, uh, in big trouble. Uh, civilization, which depends on oil and energy would be in big trouble and so uh, the idea was well how are we going to meet this what are we going to do um, but this is not this was not on the agenda let's say um, of governments this isn't on the agenda of states and countries um, this was very much I these were very much ideas which were floating around in the um, in the ecological, uh, in the world of ecology, let's say. Now, this is, I mean, I remember these conversations back in the 90s about people would occasionally would hear about, ah, oh, yeah, oil's running out, yeah, yeah, okay, go away and do something else. Yeah, oil's running out, and someone and some would say, oil's running out, It's we're not going to have oil in 30 years' time, and people would say, oh, who cares, we're okay now. Um, so, 
wind the clock forward to 2021 and we're not we're not only aware of um, of oil now oil is certainly running out um, but we're also now becoming aware of the serious effects of oil as a basis of our economy because it's a carbon economy um, through the effects of climate change now back in the 90s no one was really talking about climate change nothing is we didn't really hear much about it okay so what's happened well over the time it's this it's the fact that we have become uh, enamored of, of cheap cheap oil cheap oil makes cheap plastic and the whole thing just gets uh, well it sort of amplifies if you remember we talked about things which amplify in systems and this makes um, this makes us dependent and dependency makes us vulnerable so this was uh, I think this was from about mm, 2010 yeah okay so um, now that if you if you ever have the misfortune to look to have to look in the um, in the petrol industry literature uh, and I say the misfortune because um, it's quite clear that the industry position is that there's loads of oil and we don't need to worry and global warming is not really happening um, it's a bit it's a bit denialist a bit sad really um, but it's also a little bit dangerous too um, every so often uh, from the 1960s onwards there's been a graph like this produced okay and um, this one dates from about I think it's from about 2000 2000 or so um, 2010 and the the uh, what it's saying is that the easy oil the easy oil has been extracted however where there is a will there is a way as they say and so um, since man's tech man people's techno technological um, let's say uh, ingenuity knows very very few bounds um, you can always find ways of extracting stuff from whatever until there really is nothing there and so what we have is we have uh, the easy stuff which is still lots of Middle Eastern uh, Venezuelan um, and uh, Russian deposits this is you put a hole in the ground and out the stuff comes uh, to the more difficult stuff which is uh, for example deep water um, the heavy uh, heavy stuff the polar now if you look at this graph uh, there's something which I do not understand here which is that um, there's a lot of talk about ah oh, well there's lots of oil under the Arctic region but if you look at the graph the estimates compared to the Middle East and Venezuela and Russia and even Europe there's not a lot of stuff there but you're still prepared to wreck uh, an ecosystem for it so the point of this is that um, the we've got to the we've got to the uh, the maximum of the easy oil and it's just downhill from here um, you may have heard of uh, the this is a place in, in Canada the Athabasca tar sands and there's another one which is the Alberta uh, the Alberta tar sands um, these are deposits deposits of oil mixed with sand uh, which are extremely uh, extremely dirty 
source of oil. It's an extremely dirty source of oil, and it is extremely expensive to uh, extract it. But the Canadians insist on extracting this stuff, and it's poor quality, and it's uh, it's it's economically um, it's economically not 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 particularly great. Okay, so the whole thing is that the, the transition town idea was based on this hump is coming. So maybe we're back in here. The hump is coming, and we need to prepare for it. And this is exactly what Carmen has, Carmen has just said, which is that we need to get conscious, um, wake up to it. So, uh, if you like, over over the last few years, these uh, transition town initiatives have um, started to take on uh, the the twin ideas of uh, addressing climate change and the idea of peak oil whether that's because we decide okay we're not going to use oil anymore because we have to decarbonize the economy uh, or our ways of life our way of life um, but this is a, at a community level okay so um, the whole idea is this transition of our uh, the great transition of our time away from fossil fuels moving towards a post oil low carbon economy a, a low carbon future without <laughs> going back to the caves okay so uh, where did it begin it began in a place called Totnes this is not Totnes but it's a place in not far away um, I couldn't find any pictures of Totnes Totnes is actually a very very pretty place uh, so I'm told um, the guy who started it was a guy called uh, Rob Hopkins and he founded the transition network and then, uh, since he was based in Totnes, uh, or Totnes in Devon, he uh, he was able to found or to organise um, Totnes as the first the first transition town uh, in the UK. And from that point on, about two thousand and six the whole thing the whole idea has uh has gradually s ah okay <laughs> not tottenham <laughs> no tottenham is a different thing i was thinking that's weird because tottenham is a place in london um but anyway don't worry, but don't worry because there's uh, there is some stuff in london um okay so it sort of sp <laughs> No, no, don't worry about it. Um, so, yeah, so th this idea is just sort of caught on, and it's now uh, all over the place. Uh, there are places in the US, in Belgium. We've had a couple of uh, mentions of uh, Montevello. Uh, it's a small village near Bologna. Um, uh, we've got places in France, in Sweden, in Australia, and many other countries, and there are... Uh, there are quite a number of initiatives across the world, probably not enough, because this is still only a small number. Um, but it's a surprising thing because we may be uh, we may be thinking, associating this idea with um, rich rich countries or developed countries, um, places where there's lots of let's say lots of money to be able to do stuff. Um, but there are also transition initiatives in places like India. Uh, and the interesting thing is that the the whole idea of the, of the transition movement is that um, the particular problems will all have, let's say, a general, uh, general structure, but the particular problems at the local level might be quite different to other places. So um, even though places in India may have a much lower carbon footprint, they may have, they quite often have problem of uh, access to reliable energy. They quite often have problems of uh, pollution. So um, the idea of the transition is, uh, is, to a, is to a future state 
which is better for everybody in the community. So it's not just necessarily uh, everybody on their bike and what have you. Okay, so the, the whole thing is this idea of the community um, moves forward uh, to make itself better. Okay, okay now um, this is literally, literally hot off the press. This was yesterday. Okay, so I'm going to finish. I'm going to finish with this and the next slide, um, and this. Well, it made me. It made my. Um, it made me spit more than a few feathers. Let's say. Um, so there's a a, a poll, sondaggio in Italian, uh, which is to find out about how people are thinking about lifestyle changes okay uh, and it's across 10 countries including US, UK, France and, Ger and Germany um, people prioritizing things which are already habits so let's just see what they, they were looking at uh, so look at the title few people are willing to change their lifestyle to save the planet okay Okay, so um, ignore that bit for just a minute, uh, and hopefully, hopefully you can read this a little bit. I'll try and just make it a little bit bigger, because this doing this on a PDF is a bit weird. Um, okay, so how would you rate, in terms of importance, the following measures aimed at preserving the environment and the planet? Okay, so 57 people. I don't know what the other 43. I don't know where the other 43% live, but anyway, um, so. Reducing waste, fine, okay, recycling, great, deforestation, fantastic, um, protecting animals, that's 50-50, um, making buildings more efficient energetically, okay, uh, lowering pollution, replacing fossil fuels with renewable energy, and we're sort of gradually sliding down the scale until we get to... Um, Reducing people's energy, energy consumption. That's a third say we should. It is important. Two thirds don't really care. Decreasing the amount of energy we use. Okay, so this is sort of associated with this. This is in line. Um, Favouring the use of public transport over cars. That's like one in four. Okay, 25%. Radically changing agriculture, people don't really care. Reducing travel by planes, people don't really care. Increasing the price of products that people that do not respect environmental uh, criteria, people don't. Most people don't really care. Banning fossil fossil fuel vehicles, even fewer people. Reducing meat consumption, even fewer. Reducing international trade, most people don't care. Actually. This one is a bit of a it's a bit of a weird one because the international trade, while it may sound uh, that it's going to be very carbon rich, it doesn't necessarily have to be so. But anyway, my take on this is that the message about carbon dioxide has not been understood, or it has not been communicated clearly. Because it's fine to recycle, this is great, we need to. It's fine to stop cutting down trees, we need to. It's fine to, to protect uh, cute animals, okay? But this is the bit which people are... This is where we need to... This is our everyday life. Your everyday life is not stopping deforest, deforestation. It's not protecting animal species. So I think this is the uh, this is quite a quite a survey. Okay, right. Um, I'm going to stop there because I think I think we need to I think we need to stop. So if anyone has any any comments or any questions, okay. Uh, oh, this is uh, it's died up again. Okay. It, every so every so often this sort of uh, it blocks. Every so often it blocks up. So let me just unshare.
Okay. Um, let me get rid of that. Let me get rid of that. Maybe. Okay. And. Okay. People don't understand how very critical in terms of. Okay, I think I think Kamal, that's that's a good question. I mean, I think um, I think it, it. I think most people don't think about stuff until it's sort of right. Um, let's say it's right on their doorstep. So it's like the. Um, it's like the the parable or the fable of boiling the frog, yeah. That, uh, that if you do it slowly enough, the frog doesn't know it's being boiled, which is a bit nasty, but that's the that's the way it works, yeah. Uh, the other the other parable is the uh, the village pond, where uh, the village pond where you have. Uh, a leaf, uh, an invasion, an invasive leaf, which doubles every 24 hours, and it starts off in a corner, and then at some point you ha you notice that half the pond is covered. Um, how much time have you got to act? You've got one day. Now I'll show I'll show you the model uh, next time if you like, but um, it's that until it's actually on your on your doorstep people don't think about it yeah okay so thank you very thank you very much everybody i hope it i, I hope it wasn't too traumatic today um <laughs> and we i will see you again in a couple of weeks so i will yeah i will sort of see <laughs> see your names again in a couple of weeks time so um i hope uh i hope i hope i hope, uh, hope things are okay and don't get too depressed about stuff. No. I think that's the that's the that's the that's the key thing. But it's difficult. Sometimes it's difficult not to. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you, Gordon. I'd like to share a picture. Yeah. Okay. Mm, I can stop. I can stop the sharing. Yeah, I couldn't. It wouldn't let me stop. Ah, okay. Fantastic. Thank you. And I'll share mine. Hmm. Let me see. Do you see it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I love it. It's in the fish. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> okay, so bye bye <laughs> with this nice okay. picture. <laughs> um, allora, Agnese? Yes. Ci, allora, ci sentiamo via telefono o voi stiamo, su, stiamo in linea un attimino? Beh, se non hai se non hai proprio fretta, 5 minuti? Sì, ok, dai. Salutiamo. Ok, ok, ok. Let's say bye bye to everyone. Let's mm -hmm. stop the recording.